so much, Kayla. And um, someone's hot chocolate is here, is this? Well, I do think um, I'm really honoured to um, be able to say a few opening words today, and I'm just really sorry I need to explain that there's a hustings. People might know that there's an election going on, I don't know quite well, anyway, there's an election going on and there's a hustings up at Sussex University, so I've got to be there at 7 o'clock, so that is why I'm going to be speaking even faster than usual, and, um, and unfortunately unable to stay for the whole meeting. But it is a, a, a huge pleasure to be here, and in particular to welcome Paul Allen and Kit Jones from the Centre for Alternative Technology. Their Zero Carbon Britain report, which I'm sure you know of, is an incredibly important, a groundbreaking and inspiring contribution to the case for rapidly and radically transforming our energy system and economy so that it's fit for the 21st century. Um, maybe just by way of an introduction, I was going to say a little bit about the political context in which this report is produced. But just before I even do that, let me just quickly say how, how proud I am really to be standing here in Parliament um, and talking about what all of you are doing in this city and being able to make the case that the politicians at Westminster really ought to follow the lead of people in our, in our wonderful city. And I'm thinking, for example, of students at Sussex University who are part of the global fossil-free divestment movement. I'm thinking of the trustees of, of Brighthelm Church who've decided to sell their investments in companies whose core business is fossil fuels alongside other churches organised into the grouping Operation NOAA. I'm thinking of Brighton Energy Co-op, which is literally paving our city's rooftops with solar power. And I'm thinking of Brighton and Hove Energy Services Cooperative, you've just heard from Kayla. BESCO is helping so many people cut their energy bills, and I want to be able to let you know that they will be having a share offer uh, in the next few weeks so that individuals, all of us, can become part of their amazing uh, achievements as well. So I urge you to look out for those. Not even just all of that, but also the numerous schools and community groups in our sunny city, city all of which are uh, switching over to solar. And of course the changes that have, made, have been made to the Hanover Community Centre in terms of the insulation, in terms of the uh, solar that's planned and so forth. So there's lots of positive local good news, and I wanted to start with that because as ever, once I start talking about Parliament, it all goes slightly downhill. So I wanted to start positively and hopefully end positively, uh, but in the meantime, sadly, take you down a slight uh, uh, darker course, perhaps. Um, the good news, actually, I have a bit more good news. The good news is there was an opinion poll from Comres uh, just uh, this month, actually, a few weeks ago which revealed that climate change policy is set to be pretty important in this year's general election. Apparently, over a quarter of people are saying that it could change which party they vote for, depending on the strength of that party's climate policy. I mean, I'd like it to be much more, but a quarter is still, you know, it, it ranks higher than quite often climate or what the environment does when you ask people in opinion polls how important is this issue to you. So, so that, is, that is important. And about a week later, the... Uh, party leaders from the uh, three establishment parties, Ed Miliband, Nick Clegg, David Cameron, signed a joint statement um, that I think was coordinated by the Green NGOs, they didn't ask us to sign, but anyway, uh, about the importance of tackling climate change. And that pledge that the party leaders signed is very helpful in one sense, because it puts in writing a pledge to seek a strong global climate deal at the end of the year at the uh, Paris summit. It pledges to end the use of unabated coal and power generation and to accelerate the transition to a low-carbon economy. And so given that, you might think, well, what, you know, what's she complaining about? That all sounds very good. But as you will know as well as I do, there's quite often a gulf between what um, political parties say and what they do. And so when it comes to the politics of climate change at Westminster, I'd argue that there are three big changes that we need to see. First, exactly closing that gap between the rhetoric and the action, not just on climate change per se, but on cold homes, fuel poverty, and affordable energy. Second, I think we need to bust the myth that there's necessarily a trade-off between the transition to a zero carbon sustainable energy system and affordability, security of supply, and jobs. There is no such trade-off. As Sharon Burrow, who's head of the International Trade Union Confederation has said, and I quote, for unions, it's simple, there are no jobs on a dead planet. And, as others have pointed out, helpfully, uh, President Putin can't turn off the wind or the sun. Um, so if we're talking about energy security, we might bear that in mind. <coughs> and the third priority, I think, is that we need to end the deep-seated and, frankly, really dangerous influence of big energy companies and the fossil fuel industry, um, and on their, of their lobbyists, really, over Whitehall and Westminster. 
There are a small number of powerful vested interests who are intent on rubbishing the feasibility and desirability of getting onto a path towards 100% renewable energy. And the reason they're against it is because they know that they'd be pretty much game over for business as usual if renewables actually were enabled to reach their full potential. These are merchants of doubt who ignore the reality that without an end to their idea of business as usual, it'll also be pretty much game over for our stable, habitable, human-friendly climate. So let me say a few words about the infrastructure bill by way of illustration of these, of these different key issues at Westminster that I think we need to address. <coughs> these are big fights really that are going on over the infrastructure uh, bill. Um, and you might know that they, it was recently passed by both houses of parliament. It's just become an act. Uh, and of course, what it's about is upgrading the UK's infrastructure. And I would certainly agree that that's vital to creating jobs, preparing the country for the challenges that we'll face over the coming decades. The government stated the bill would, and I quote, improve how we fund, plan, manage, and maintain our national infrastructure. But if you were to take that at face value, then surely that would mean an infrastructure to create a prosperous, zero carbon, jobs rich economy that's resilient to flooding and other climate impacts coming our way. And although I'm pleased that there were some amendments, including things like you know, the inclusion of a cycling and walking investment strategy and a new clause that goes some way to recognising that fracking might not indeed help us meet our climate targets, that isn't really what happened. The infrastructure bill was not about putting in place the kind of resilient infrastructure that we need if we're to face the reality of some degree of climate change. Instead, what we had was a, 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 an act that instead of prioritising low carbon public transport, walking and cycling, the bill facilitates major new road schemes that will encourage more traffic, exacerbating air pollution and harming the countryside. It also, as well, uh, has uh, steps towards privatising the highways agency. And instead of a nationwide energy efficiency retrofit programme to end fuel poverty, cut energy bills and reduce emissions, together with a rapid transition to a zero-carbon renewable energy system with increased public ownership. The bill, instead of doing all of that, it changes the law so that uh, the laws of trespass, which means that the energy companies can now frack away under your home without you being even uh, asked for your consent. Perhaps even more worryingly, it also includes a new duty to maximise oil and gas recovery. It's actually called that, the max of the Max, maximising the economic recovery of fossil fuels. And it's placing a duty on the government to do that, which seems to me the most perverse thing we could possibly be doing at a time when we know that the UK needs to be reducing fossil fuel dependence and getting to grips with unburnable carbon. And even the governor of the Bank of England is admitting that the vast majority of fossil fuel reserves, known fossil fuel reserves, have to stay in the ground if we're to have any hope of avoiding two degrees warming. And so the idea that there's going to be a statutory duty to maximise recovery of fossil fuels, I think, is, is, is just, frankly, obscene. So instead of paving the way for a huge investment in affordable, zero-carbon council and social housing, it weakens the building standards for new homes. It means that energy bills for households living in them will be hundreds of pounds higher. Worse still, so little time was allocated to the infrastructure bill that most amendments that I and other MPs tabled in order to try to improve the bill weren't even debated, let alone voted on. It made a mockery of the democratic system, not just of party leaders' claims to take climate change seriously. So many Brighton residents have contacted me about their concerns about fracking, and as I say, this bill was the one that enables fracking to take place under your home. And the concerns that people have raised with me are around health, around environment, around climate grounds, and I'm proud to be one of just 52 MPs who voted in favour of a complete moratorium on fracking that would have seen a freeze on all shale gas exploration and drilling for a very minimum of 18 months. And I think the, the prime reason, at least in terms of, of, of my vote on that, was that it just seems so perverse to be investing in a whole new fossil fuel industry at exactly the time that we know that we need to be making this, this transition to a, um, to a renewable and energy efficiency future. And I think what's so frustrating about this is that there is huge potential of UK renewables. The sector already supports more than 100,000 jobs. <coughs> Solar PV, which is just one of the many diverse technologies that are at our disposal, could alone support nearly 50,000 jobs by 2030 and could power the equivalent of 18 million homes. A thriving, homegrown renewable energy sector, including solar, but also wind and wave and tidal, should be our top priority. But it was almost entirely absent from the infrastructure bill. So I think we should replace that duty to maximise oil and gas exploitation with a duty to maximise sustainable energy generation from the UK's wind and wave and solar and tidal and other resources. 
and a duty to maximise the proportion of that in the hands of community and cooperative organisations. I think we need democratic control of energy, not a system designed for and by the big energy six. And I also think that energy efficiency should be the UK's top infrastructure priority, and crucially with the funds to match. Retrofitting the UK's leaky housing stock is the only permanent solution to fuel poverty and to higher energy bills, issues that I know are a high priority for all of my constituents. It's essential if we're to meet our carbon targets, and it's also an economic no-brainer. Research for the Energy Bill Revolution campaign shows that an ambitious energy efficiency programme could create 108,000 new jobs, would generate £1.27 in tax revenues for every £1 invested. It makes economic sense, it makes environmental sense. And the bottom line is that an effective response to climate change requires a complete shift to a carbon neutral energy system within a generation in all the major economies, including Britain. And as the Zero Carbon Britain report will show, we know how to do this. We have the technology, the engineering capacity to do it, and we can afford to do it. The sole thing that is lacking is the political will to do it, and that's why meetings such as this, I think, are so important in terms of garnering that political will. And it really matters this year of all years, because as you will know, we have the Paris Climate Change Summit at the end of this year, where we need a scientifically robust and equitable global agreement to give a good chance of keeping climate change below two degrees warming. Someone who knows a lot about this in the United Kingdom is our former top energy and climate diplomat, a man called John Ashton. And his wise words, first of all on fracking, are this. He says, you can be in favour of fixing the climate, or you can be in favour of exploiting shale gas, but you can't be in favour of both at the same time. And on international action, he says this, our influence has always depended on the credibility of our domestic policies. How can we expect others to, uh, how can we expect to persuade others if we ourselves are not doing what we ask of them. And I think that's an incredibly important reminder as we go into this year now, as I say, with the Paris summit not very many months away. And maybe that is a good point now to hand over to Paul and Kit to talk about their Zero Carbon Britain work so you can see precisely how we can lead by example. It is perfectly possible to do it. I just want to end by sharing again with you a, 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 an anecdote that I know that I've um, shared before. But it just sums up for me the, the frustration of, of why are we not doing this, and it's that famous cartoon of the professor with the list of benefits of moving to a zero carbon world, and on the list of the things he's got behind him are more affordable public transport, the end of fuel poverty, local food, affordable food, you know, kids playing in the streets again, and then there's a person in the, in the audience with a speech bubble coming out of their mouth saying, but what if climate change is a hoax and we've created a better world for no reason? Well, I think there are really good reasons to be creating a better world, and I wish you very well in your discussions about that. Thank you.